Okay, so let's do part two of that enzyme lab. So in part one, we looked at peroxidase and hydrogen peroxide, and we counted, well, we didn't count air bubbles, but we monitored how long it took for those disks to float based on the accumulation of oxygen. And so for now in enzymes part two, we're working off of the same reaction. Enzyme plus substrate equals enzyme plus product, like it always does. This time we're working with peroxidase from a turnip, doesn't really matter, except that it works better for this particular reaction. So last time we did yeast, this time we're doing turnip. But we have the turnip peroxidase plus the H2O2, so that's going to be your substrate. And it's going to be the same reaction as before, peroxidase plus water plus oxygen. That's the exact same reaction that we did with the floating disc reaction um, earlier. Here's the big exception, except we're taking this oxygen and also in our test tube, we're putting in something called guaiacol. Guaiacol is an oxygen acceptor. And when guaiacol and oxygen get together, they produce something called tetraguaiacol. Tetraguaiacol turns colors. And that's what we're using it for in this case. Um, what we want to be able to do is to monitor our rate of reaction based on color change of the reaction. So the color change tells you how fast the reaction is happening. We measure color change with a spectrophotometer. That's the tool that we use to quantify color. It's kind of one of those things where it's like, some people might see my sweater and think it's purple, some might think it's pink, some might think it's fuchsia. It can be a really subjective thing. Well, a spectrophotometer set properly quantifies colors and we don't argue with numbers as much and so that's why scientists like them so much more. So we're able to say, rather than saying, well that's light brown or that's medium brown or that's dark brown, we can say the absorbance of that color at 470 nanometers wavelength is this and that's not an argumentative kind of thing. So that's the kind of the interest of what you're doing in this lab. Hopefully you've read your lab prep. Uh, if you haven't, I strongly recommend that you pause the video and you take a few minutes to read this because it can be really confusing. Part of your pre-lab, and something I will be looking for when I come around to verify pre-lab, is that you have made a data table that tells you what goes in your two different test tubes. Um, and it's going to tell you up here to use two test tubes, mark one substrate and the other one enzyme, and then it tells you exactly what goes in each test tube. I want you to make a data table. And here's a hint, if you ignore this thing on the bottom, that's the answer. That's what's going in each test tube. Your substrate test tube has DI water, hydrogen peroxide, and your guaiacol in it for a total of seven and a half milliliters. Your enzyme test tube has six milliliters of DI water and one and a half milliliters of peroxidase. Um, I'll show you, this is actually gonna be a couple videos long today at this lab. I'll show you how to measure all of these things out 0.3 mils and 0.2 mils can be real tricky if you don't know what you're doing, um, but I'll show you how to do it. We're going to remember that we need to prepare these two test tubes completely independent of each other. As soon as you mix them, the reaction begins, and as soon as you combine them, you've got to get them in that spectrophotometer because you've got to be taking your measurements um, at, at the increments that I've indicated or that I'll tell you about here in just a second. And so you're going to prepare these two test tubes, but you don't mix them together until you are physically standing in front of a spectrophotometer and you are ready to begin your experiment and you're ready to begin your data collection. So this is a part of your procedure. So get to this point and then move on to the next video. All right, hi guys. Um, we, at this point, you should have um, watch the little tutorial about the spectrophotometer. You should have watched the little tutorial about the micropipette, and you should have um, read about the procedure. And you should have watched the video about having made the little data table in your in your uh, lab notebook about what's going to go into each of your two test tubes. So now we're actually ready to generate data. And remember, the purpose of this whole lab is for you to learn how to generate data. There's not as much data analysis as there is with the uh, disk lab. This is about how you use a spectrophotometer, how you use all this equipment. So that if you do want to use um, this kind of stuff in order to do your inquiry project um, that you'll do later on in the unit, that you have the proper techniques in order to do so. Um, so, at this point, we are ready to start building our two test tubes, our substrate test tube and our enzyme test tube, using the stuff um, that you wrote out in your uh, procedure. Um, and we're going to build these two test tubes separately 
and then we will combine them, and as soon as we combine them is when our reaction begins, and so that's when we have to start timing our reaction and collecting the data that it says. Um, and so we are going to begin by labeling our test tubes, because if you put something in the wrong test tube, you're going to end up with starting your reaction without getting a color change and it'll be finished before you even get to a spectrophotometer or getting no color change at all or something silly like that. So you want to make sure that you keep straight what is your enzyme test tube and what is your substrate test tube. Um, both of them are mostly water and so uh, it's easy to start by saying, okay, I need to put six mils of DI water in your enzyme test tube and seven in your substrate test tube. Um, what's Important is that you use DI water for this. Don't use tap water. It will mess with your results. And so we want to make sure that we use our jug. So to measure our water, you're just going to use your graduated cylinder. Um, and so I'm going to start by filling my substrate test tube with 7 mils. And you do need to be fairly precise with this. Very often, as you guys know, I tell you that you don't need to be precise. Um, in biology, but this is one of those times when you need to do it properly. And so right on down to the last drop, if you want to get a dropper, in order to make sure that you do it properly, you can. I've got seven mils that's going to go in my substrate tube. Um, you guys are going to actually have test tube racks, not cups, because I don't want these to fall over. And then I'm going to get six mils for my enzyme tube. and enzyme, and we're good to go there. The only other thing I need for my enzyme tube is my enzyme. And so uh, I will have wooden test tube racks set up in a couple of different locations, clearly labeled with what's what, because I don't want you guys to get the wrong stuff. Um, and that's really the only way this lab can go wrong. So here's your, sub, or your, uh, your enzyme. Your peroxidase, it's clearly labeled peroxidase, and it tells you how much of it you need in case you got confused. You need one and a half mils. In order to measure one and a half mils, we're actually going to use a graduated pipette. This is not a micro pipette, but a graduated pipette has these little lines on it that tell you exactly what the measurements are. So there's one mil, and then right there is half a mil. You can see the little 0.5. So you have to do uh, there's no measurements up here in the bulb. So you're going to do fill it up first to the 1 and then the second time to the 0.5 um, in order to get your 1.5 mils and then you'll put that in your enzyme container. And so when you're not using uh, the stuff in the test tube, leave it capped, uh, mostly because it really stinks. All of it really stinks. And so you want to just kind of keep it capped so that the room doesn't smell awful. It's going to smell awful anyway, but let's try to keep it down. Um, and so you'll get, uh, squeeze your little graduated pipe pep in, slowly release until you get up to the one mil mark. Once you get to the one mil mark, pull the tip out and then you can say, okay, that's my enzyme, put it in my enzyme tube. And then we do the second time only up to our 0.5 mark. Excellent, and that's enzyme. Done. Don't take this with you. Leave it here. Otherwise, we end up with cross-contamination because people bring them from other places in the room. Okay, good to go there. Enzyme is done because all that had to go into that enzyme tube was the 6 mils of the DI water and the 1.5 mils of peroxidase, and that one is finished. Um, notice a total volume is 7.5 milliliters. We actually have a total volume of 7.5 milliliters in the other test tube as well. We're going to use that to kind of check our work before we combine them to begin our reaction to make sure we have the right number of amounts of stuff. So now we need to put our glycol and our hydrogen peroxide um, in our substrate tube. Okay, that makes sense because what we're trying to break down is that H2O2 and then the glycol is going to take the oxygen gas from this reaction and turn it into a color. So that's what we have to do next. Um, so I'm going to take, just to make sure I don't goof, I'm going to take my enzyme tube and set it aside uh, so that it's easier for, well, because I have to focus on several things right now. So at the glycol station, again, it is very clearly marked. 
you need 200 microliters of glycol. If we look on our micropipetter at set to 100, which means I need two doses of this stuff. So I'm going to take my stopper out, depress my plunger to the first stop, submerge the tip, release my plunger, pull it out, come over to my substrate test tube, and now I depress to the second stopper just to make sure I get it all out of there, and I'm going to do this two times. So that was one. I'm going to depress to the first stop, submerge, release, and then to the second stop here to make sure I get all of my glycol. So that's that. Again, you're going to leave your micropipetter with the glycol so we don't get any cross-contamination. Next, we're ready for our hydrogen peroxide. And again, these are going to be in different places around the room just to make sure you don't get confused. Here we need 300 microliters of our hydrogen peroxide. Take the cap off. Same technique as before. Press down to the first stop. Submerge the tip. Pull up or allow it to come up. Okay, into my test tube. One, go to my second stop to get it all out. One dose. Two doses. And three doses. Okay, done. Put the stopper back on. Leave the micropipe putter where you found it. At this point, we are ready. Now, there's only going to be five spectrophotometers around the room, and so you don't want to start your reaction until you and your group has literally claimed one of them and you're standing in front of it. Um, because you are going to keep record for five minutes um, of how these numbers are changing over time. And so if you looked at step four in your lab notebook, it said to record the color, which is the absorbance, um, at one minute increments. I do think that we can probably do better than that because we have the spectrophotometer. Um, and so I think that you're probably best to do it in 30 second increments rather than in one minute increments. It's just going to give you more points to plot and I think that that will be useful. So you're going to collect data in 30 second increments. Um, so this point you have your two test tubes and then you have also obtained your cuvette, okay, because this is the one that actually fits in your spectrophotometer. And so it, this is certainly a two-person job, and so what I'm about to do, being that I am one human, is not going to be quite as graceful as what you're going to do. Um, bearing in mind that, and it tells you this in your lab notebook, the glycol can be a skin irritant, so you don't really want to get the glycol on your hands. It's actually very rare that somebody has a reaction to, or a skin reaction to touching glycol. Um, but just on the off chance, the goal here is not to get it on yourself. Um, and so when you have your test tubes, you're going to remember um, that you're going to have them actually in a rack. You're going to pour one test tube into the other. And the reality is it doesn't matter which one you pour into the other. Um, but by leaving this one in a test tube rack rather than in a cup, you have much less of a chance of actually spilling it on yourself, and it's just safer that way. Um, so you take one, take one test tube and dump it into the other. As soon as the contents meet, your reaction began. So somebody needed to start timing at that moment. Once you have combined them in this test tube, the only way you're going to be able to get absorbance values is by then putting it into the cuvette. You can see I'm already starting to change color. Um, so then you pour it immediately into your cuvette. And remember, you're trying to get it up to the bottom of that dot. There we go. Keep this test tube out because once you put the cuvette in your spectrophotometer, you're not going to be able to see what's happening. So it's kind of fun to be able to actually see the color change that the spectrophotometer is giving to you in numbers. Once you've got your cuvette, chances are good that you touched it somewhere beneath that dot. And if you did, you're going to use your chem wipes. Remember, in the green box, this is not a Kleenex. It's a chem wipe. It's special to wipe it off and you're going to then insert this puppy in your spectrophotometer. So I'm going to walk us over to the spectrophotometer, which is here. Here it is. And I'm going to put it, oops, you will have, I don't have enough hands for this, you will have taken your blank out before you started this. And then you put your sample in your spectrophotometer. Okay, looks like that. 
close it up, and then you're going to take a reading, this right here, every 30 seconds. So somebody's got to keep an eye on the clock and say 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, and you do that for five minutes. And again, the reason it doesn't really matter that we only have five spectra photometers is because you actually only need the spectra photometer for five full minutes. Um, once you're done, you take that cuvette out, put the blank back in it so that the next group can blank theirs. Uh, right, remember making sure that you have 100% transmittance and 0% absorbance. Um, so you want to make sure that you take that cuvette back out, um, you've put the blank back in, uh, and then you're done. You're ready to graph your data and whatnot. Only other thing I need to tell you is that guaiacol cannot go down the sink, so I'll have a special waste container for the guaiacol, and then we have the district dispose of that in a safe way. So, oh, you know what, and I just realized that I did something really atrocious. Don't do this. I'm supposed to be on absorbance, and right now I'm on transmittance, and so if, uh, if you switch over to absorbance, you're able to see these numbers as they, as they change, and you can record that value. All right, I think we're done. That's it. Thanks for watching the video. Have a good day.